Kia ora everybody, my name is Ian Mitchell, um, I'm Relationship Manager for the Cody Dieback Program. Um, <clears throat> I have a little bit of Māori blood in me, it doesn't show very much, except probably in my accent apparently. Um, <clears throat> uh, but that, you know, that, that particular bloodline is from that mid-north area, uh, Kirikiri Hokianga. Um, and I just, so just acknowledge that in the first place, that's who I am, where I'm from. Um, on my father's side, a pure Irish, straight up and down Irish, probably a result of the Irish famine, <laughs> Irish uh, potato famine. Um, so feel very, feel very immersed in this, in this, um, <laughs> in this <issue. laughs> uh, And, and, you know, and <clears throat> it really is a serious issue. So, you know, we know... I'm probably going to repeat a lot of things that have already been said today, um, and if you like, I guess summarise some of those things. Um, so we're talking about a biosecurity issue because this, we believe this disease has come from overseas approximately 60 years ago, um, and we're talking about a keystone forest, a keystone ecology, and a keystone species. Um, I, as relationship manager, I manage the... Um, communications and liaison part of the biosecurity response we call it engagement and behavior change that is effectively what we're trying to do this is the information I'm trying to cover today in my in my talk um, firstly just to give you a little bit more insight about the multi-agency response that that we are certain that our messaging is based around a value-based uh, approach um, and just to give you a, a little bit of an insight to the communications liaison function, and, and I've got a couple of case studies for us uh, to look at. In terms of the biosecurity response, we're a multi-agency response, so that is mana whenua, tangata whenua. So, and, and you saw in Matohori's uh, presentation, the very first presentation of the day, you see how complex that already is. Um, in terms of the multiple pathways that Māori can come and be involved in this, pr of this uh, response. Um, and then we have uh, Ministry for Primary Industries, um, Department of Conservation, who manage, you know, a third of New Zealand, um, uh, um, and the four regional councils which represent the, or unitary authorities, which represent the, uh, the natural range of the code. Um, the response is, is a, is a long-term response, so we accept that this disease is here, it has already significant impact in our, in our natural forest, um, and that we have to deal with it from a long-term point of view. Um, the, the overall um, purpose of the response is ultimately to, to enhance the modi of the forest to enhance the life force of Cody forests as we know it. So this is about having healthy forests. Um, a subset under that, keeping our forests healthy, is to contain the disease. Um, and sort of a test to that, stop its spread. And ultimately to have uh, effective collaboration between all the parties to make that work.
This is what the biosecurity response model looks like. So those, all of those agencies come together in the, in the lead team, uh, which represents the government, a governance body. Under that, we have a program manager. And under the program manager, we have these four um, uh, work streams, if you like. So planning and intelligence is uh, particularly around science and research, engagement and behavior change, communication liaison, operations, and you heard from uh, John Beachman this morning, and logistics, that's you know getting people and things to the right places at the right time. <laughs> and in terms of what we're talking about, you've already seen this map this morning as well. So we know exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about the red dots, where we know that this disease exists for sure. The yellow spots is about we haven't detected it there. This, in effect, is the closest thing we have to a distribution map, but it's not a distribution map. We have not fully mapped our forest to know where it is and where it isn't. We have had limited resources in order to find and prove where the disease is, and, uh, and that's the best that we've come up with at the moment. Uh, the, I guess the very first starting point for us in the engagement and behaviour change team is based around a, a social science context, and Jura to, um, to Marie. Um, and, and really what ba laid the baseline for us was two forest user surveys early in the piece of this response, um, 2010, 2011. There were some key findings that came out of that that laid a, a platform, if you like, that our engagement and behaviour change team has been working from. Um, out of that, we've developed a, a communication strategy, key messages, um, you know, the need for relationship management. Um, we've had more recent surveys, but um, they're not on the same, they don't replicate those early um, um, responses. And, um, and I think it's really important to keep in mind that lag between raising awareness and effectively achieving behavior change in our, in our, in our general population. So starting from that, that, that core issue around the Cody and the values that we represent <coughs> or that are represented by the Cody, you know, it's long and short, it's our, it's our national icon, it's up there with uh, the All Blacks and the Pavlova. Uh, <laughs> and, um, but, having, but having said that, you know, there's a whole other level to that um, when we're talking about Tangata Whenua. And, and, and somebody said earlier, um, you know, whole different value systems come into play and, um, and, that, and that sometimes we need to agree to disagree and, and that, you know, and it, and it may be that these things don't integrate actually. Uh, they just stand alone, but they operate, uh, they operate in effect to give the same effect or to give a, a positive outcome. You know, the Kauri represents something very ancient in the Māori world too. Uh, Māori have a whole cosmology around the Kauri, a whole whakapapa. We're connected, this is our tūpuna. Um, around that there's a whole wānanga, there's a whole school of learning which uh, goes uh, to pre-European times um, that, that makes Kauri esteemed in lots and lots of different ways um, to, to Māori culture. Um, so there's that, there's that First Nations uh, people's issue. Uh, we lay over top of that, if you like, a Kiwi culture, and that is, you know, what Tani Mahuta represents to us. I, I saw on the news just last night, I think, you know, talking about, you know, maybe sending our kids to the Waitangi, all of our school kids to the Waitangi National Trust for a visit one time in their life at school, so that they get to understand that that, uh, you know, the building of a nation. Perhaps when they go and see Waitangi, they should probably also go and see Tāne Mahuta as well. Tāne Mahuta definitely represents a, a building of a people and a nation. So that, that very core value, both to Tangata Whenua and to the wider Kiwi population, is something that we recognise and we want to reinforce and, re and wherever possible, raise the significance of that. So
So we put it in context historically, and all of these figures have been given this morning. But it's important to just you know to reiterate the you know where this value system comes from. The vast majority of of Kauri was lost to slash and burn. Some went to timber and shipbuilding. Uh, and um, <coughs> earlier speaker said less than one percent of old Kauri forest remain. Maybe half a percent, probably less. It's important to put Kauri in that context of the early development of, of, uh, of New Zealand. Um, <coughs> Kauri was New Zealand's largest export, from what I can see out of the figures from uh, Turnbull <coughs> Library, for almost 50 years. Uh, Kōkohu Wharf in its heyday, late, last, uh, late um, 1800s, second largest port in the world by volume. And out of that, out of that Cody came roads, bridges, ships, housing. Cody went all over the world, and uh, Matuhori mentioned earlier this morning, Cody went to San Francisco to help rebuild after the earthquake of 1907, I think it was. Um, you know, re putting masts on ships returned people to their homes all over the world. So, um, you know, historically, it's very important to us today if we put. Uh, Cody in a contemporary uh, uh, situation. We're talking not only about a spiritual icon, we're also talking about a keystone ecology of northern forest, but it's only a remnant. What remains? You know, the the, uh, the Cody that remain feel lonely for their friends that have gone. Uh, so, you know, what we're dealing with is a remnant forest. The the, some of the things we've heard from earlier today is uh, the richest, most biologically diverse forest um, in New Zealand, possibly uh, a significant in worldwide terms. Fixes carbon um, like no other place. You see a whole lot of big coyotes standing side by side. You have to sort of squeeze through them. You know, you get an understanding for how much carbon is represented in a coyote forest. And at a lower level, you know, there's those economic issues. Yes, government's got to put it up there in terms of what does it take to fund a program like this uh, to save our Kauri. But, you know, uh, and, a, and, a va and a whole value system, those commodity values, the timber plantations that Greg talked about earlier, um, tourism trade, I think we've had some members of the tourism industry here and what the Kauri represents to them in that industry. Um, you know, so Kauri today still has amazing value to New Zealand. If I return now to those surveys, just really quickly run through those issues, but from, from May 2010, when the first survey was taken to August 2011, um, awareness was raised according to those uh, surveys from 21% to 48%. So 48%, almost half of the population, are aware of Cody dieback as at August 2011. Māori are generally more aware than the general population, and I think that represents our interest and value base. Uh, and the highest group in particular were Northland Māori, who were, you know, two-thirds of Northland Māori were already aware of the issue. <coughs> Aucklanders uh, were more aware of the problem than the general population. Forest users in general more, were more aware than the general public. I think those reflect, you know, again, as, as Marie um, stated earlier, those just reflect uh, uh, interest um, and what you do from a, from day to day and, and you're interested in these sorts of issues. All those people that are, were aware of the issue considered the issue to be serious. Some of the key key results we got from that uh, from those early studies were that we needed to strengthen the messaging, that it needed to be positive, that people needed to understand that it was, well people did understand that it was serious and they wanted to share that, that seriousness. Uh, something that came through strongly was the need to be consistent in our messaging. At that, at that time there were sort of various types of signage and signs and designs around. Uh, it also showed that there was a need for the facilities to be available. I saw um, Giles's, Professor Giles Hardy's slide earlier where it said, you know, 
what what stops you from undertaking hygiene activities and the biggest chunk of the pie was the hygiene facility wasn't available um, so that's really important and then and then ultimately you know to have ongoing e engagement and education uh, so out of that out of that survey which became our sort of baseline if you like you know two things come out of that firstly is the communications part and that's internally so we've got We've got multiple agencies, people coming from uh, quite complex, uh, different cultures. Every, every agency represents a different culture, has its own culture. And then, um, and then you've got the, the relationship, the Crown Māori relationship, which has been strained and under tension for at least 170 years. Uh, and then we've got, within the programme, we've got these work, work streams, which could represent silos. So just internal communications within these multiple organisations is already complex. And we haven't even looked outside in terms of engaging with the public yet. Then we have the external communications processes. And so um, we, have, we have developed a whole range of communications collateral. So that is sort of uh, posters, brochures, pamphlets, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we've got <coughs> the Cody Connect newsletter, which goes out to all, you know, anybody who's interested in taking it, it's an e-newsletter. Um, you, you can register that for that on, on the website. Our website has become really core in that it's our opportunity to make all of our information available generally to the public virtually immediately. Uh, so as soon as a, um, a something is is published and endorsed by the program, it can go up on the website and be available to the public at large immediately in full detail. That, so that's been really key to us and social media in terms of, uh, we have a, a Facebook page, please go there and like it if you haven't been there, go and have a look. It gives us the opportunity to be uh, um, current with communities. Uh, so underneath that sort of uh, um, general awareness raising, external communication stuff, as all of those sort of things like uh, participating in events and, and, uh, and um, uh, public events and, and just awareness raising activities of various types. And then ultimately there's this process of engagement and engagement takes place um, firstly, firstly because tangata whenua are a real key component to this response then that engagement takes place at one level and in its own context. And then there's engagement that... The, the thing is, when you raise awareness about an issue, then people want to see action. And the action only really occurs when you engage. And so, you know, um, we've got strategies around engaging directly with industries and those high-risk user groups. So when you look at that picture, we've got you know everything from the visitor, the overseas tourist who comes in, maybe takes one walk into one Cody Forest one time, through to you know the pig hunter who's in there every weekend, um, off track uh, with a horse, a dog, and you know and uh, up to mud in his ear, uh, in mud up to his ears. That's what I would call a high risk user group. <coughs> So there's uh, examples of the communications collateral. We've tried to take that baseline information from that earlier survey and, and utilize it. So it's about putting a positive message out there. It's a save our Cody Forest. This is us. We're all in this together. Uh, something positive. But at the same time, being really clear, they are dying. Our Cody Forests are dying because of this disease. This disease moves by soil movement. And that, that connection is actually critical. That's one of the complexities of this message. Um, and, and because of that soil movement, please undertake these hygiene activities. <coughs> and so we've produced a whole lot of communications around that. That, that picture that you see there on the poster really becomes our central um, uh, key messaging. Uh, the live Cody, the dead Cody, is to really get in your face. 
and and be upfront and say this is a serious issue and please please participate. These are the sort of awareness and raising activities that we're involved in. So there's your sort of field day stuff. Um, so it's the AMP field day, sorry, AMP show, uh, or Northland field day, sorry. Uh, this is a, a community group that are going out planting Cody trees. Uh, this is media stuff, um, TV. Um, this is, you know, community halls involving whole communities. These sort of events, fun runs, so on, and on the marae. <coughs> And what we've found um, by engaging with people, you know, we can talk about this stuff and engage people with a pamphlet and a brochure and a poster and all that, but it's actually when people go and enter the forest and see these trees that are dying, uh, that they are personally affected by that. We don't want people rushing out into the bush to find dead or dying Cody or of this disease. But where we have the opportunity to give that people that experience, we've found that experience is really valuable to commitment. And the other stuff, and, and Ian Horner has done a, just recently done a really fantastic job of engaging with our community. So he's taking this really important science that's being worked on now and going out and engaging with our communities directly. And that makes a difference. That makes a difference. It makes a difference to mana whenua, to tangata whenua, and it makes a difference to the communities as a whole. And it allows us, you know, to me this is a, what was spoken about earlier, this is early engagement in terms of this research process, um, and it's involving people right at the outset. Uh, John Beachman spoke earlier about the risk assessment process, so where we have a uh, disease site, um, we engage all of the agencies and tangata whenua and key resource people. So th this is about believing that local knowledge is uh, indispensable in terms of managing risk around the site. Ultimately, as we engage with communities, this is about firstly educating people. So you know, people become aware of the problem, but when you are educated about the problem, you say, hey, that's a really serious issue, and I will undertake those hygiene practices. After the education comes the empowerment, so that's, that's the ongoing engagement with communities over time that empowers people to say, this is ours, and it's up to us to do something about it. And whether it's containing a, a problem, on the one hand, or on the other hand, keeping it out. And the, you know, quotable quote of the day, uh, Peter, keep the bastard out, man. <laughs> that's, that's it. It's right there. Um, and, and so just to, you know, just to, in terms of uh, um, engaging with communities, it's also about raising the capacity of communities to deal with these biosecurity issues. If you like, and we've heard about this from our scientists this morning. If you like, Cody is carrying a carrying a message that's good for all of the bush. It's carrying a message about biosecurity. About you know, we've just heard about there's dozens, hundreds of other phytophthora that could be coming in every day. They could be hybridizing with the one we've already got and giving us a bigger problem. Right now, Cody is carrying a message for all of New Zealand about biosecurity. If only we had the ears to listen. Uh, capacity building in rural communities so that the local people are engaged in such a way as they could be doing the soil sampling in their, in their forest that they feel connected to by way of whakapapa, by way of historical involvement. Um, and then ultimately that the local people are involved in the local solutions and therefore own them. So we're going to close a track. We do that with the community, with the community's blessing, and the community works with it and helps to share that message. Um, 
compliance to use of cleaning stations. 80% was a funny number you picked out of the air there, Marie. We, um, Auckland Council have put uh, cameras on some of our cleaning stations and earlier as low as 80% of people were not complying with them. In recent times we have taken uh, uh, other surveys and are starting in, in one survey that was done, it's a, only a limited survey, but it showed up to 80% were complying. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I think the message is starting to get home. Um, uh, and, and ultimately, if people aren't buying it into it through way of, you know, direct communication and, and, and uh, that value system, then, you know, local communities are going to be doing their thing anyway. So it's, it's, uh, it's that peer pressure stuff too over time. Ultimately, there are levels of messaging. So I don't want you to get to the forest edge and then find out, oh, I should have cleaned my shoes, but there's no cleaning station here. You know, ultimately, that messaging needs to happen at levels and levels and levels. So by the time you've already got to the forest, you've already got there with your shoes clean. You understand that. That's where we're trying to get to. That, to me, means behavior change. This is about, you know, the value of our kauri, and respect, and ultimately, you know, courtesy. <laughs> so now I just want to give you a, uh, a couple of examples of engagement because um, there are two different, quite different processes that happen in the Māori world as against the European world, and just to give you a little taste of that. So um, I think John pointed out this site at Punaruku earlier today, um, and we started there with uh, with the knowledge that we had one infected tree on one track in a 10,000 hectare forest, Russell Forest. One site, Punaruku. Uh, our co-mato for Cody Dieback uh, program and the chair of the Tangata Whenua Rōpū, Matua Hori Parata, who spoke earlier today, is Ngāti Wai, belongs to this area. Um, so obviously our engagement was had to be pretty robust because you've already heard our, our Komato speak this morning. He's quite he's uh, very consistent in his messaging also to uh, to the world. And so this is about mana whenua having uh, what that what that term means. Mana whenua is, is means you know traditional historical authority over these lands and connection over time. So, you know, we engage not only with mana whenua and, um, but this is also actually a Department of Conservation forest, so it's managed by the Department of Conservation. Um, and, and there's also the opportunity to bring in regional council who, who are interested to, you know, to protect the areas that surround the de Department of Conservation land. And so, you know, looking at the infected site directly on site. Out of, that, out of that risk assessment process, we, don't, we need further engagement with these communities. And so the Ngāti Wairunanga uh, Resource Management Unit picked that up. We supported an engagement process so that, um, so that the resource manager, uh, he went out into the school and spoke to the schools about it. So it's, so it's again, it's about the local people, locally known, educating, the own local people. You know, probably, you know, this is a typical Northland rural community school. There's about 40 kids in that school. Quite different to maybe a, an Auckland urban school. Um, all age groups are represented there. Um, and probably most of those kids will be relations to each other. So we, so we take that from, you know, not only engaging at the level of schools, and uh, uh, Clive also did a wonderful job in terms of dealing with the tramping clubs, the, the hunting uh, pig hunters, and all of those various sort of uh, forest users in that area. But ultimately, he went to his komato on his marae. There's uh, roughly five marae in that, in that immediate Punaruku area. So, you know, these are very culturally intense areas, if you like. And we went from, well, Clive went from Marae to, to Marae and spoke to Komato, spoke to the whanau 
all knows Morai about the issue. Out of that Morai engagement, the Kaumatua said, we want the Rahui that track. Rahui means restriction. We don't want people to go there if we don't need to. So the uh, Toruma Fukairo, the, the carving expert, you know, raised the Pope Whenua. Those Pope Whenua were put in place and they're there to, to send the message, please don't come this way. That affected a whole lot of other parties, including Te Araroa Trails, Department of Conservation, who had to redirect track. So there's the new track being proposed. And in that process, actually, it's been a win-win situation. We're getting on to out of the area that we know of that's um, uh, the catchment and we're on a drier track and so and in terms of issues like search and rescue and forest service uh, a fire service management there's some some positive real positives that have come out of that process the the other the other thing that we were talking about that that's an infected site i just want to contrast that with a with a european style of engagement if you like and so uh, dealing with uh, Coromandel, which is, uh, as far as we know, disease-free. And uh, kia ora to uh, Max and, and Murray, members of the Kauri 2000 Trust I see here today. Um, so we started off with an initial engagement, community engagement, um, back in May 2012. That's what the engagement looked like. Half a dozen people in a big room. Okay? Uh, those were the only people we could get interested enough to actually get there. And so, and yeah, basically you had the uh, the agencies represented, Tangata Whenua, um, Department of Conservation, a regional council, Waikato Regional Council in this case, and Kodi 2000 Trust, who have been staunch advocates for the Kodi for a long time, since 2000. Out of that, out of that um, very, very early, and I couldn't even get, certain parties wouldn't even come into the room. They wouldn't actually sit in the same room with other parties in the community. Out of that, again, we supported a process with, uh, with Cody 2000 because Cody 2000 had a, such a, a wonderful connection to their community um, to, uh, to do a whole sort of campaign awareness raising across the, the peninsula. That followed through to a series of workshops. And, uh, and now we're looking at a Cody forum where you've got sitting around the table Department of Conservation, Regional Council, um, local farming industry representative, forestry industry representatives, um, a Waikato Biodiversity Forum uh, represented. Uh, this is just a wonderful uh, group of interested people whose aim is basically to fill the gaps fill the gaps of where those possible breaches might come in and Cody Dieback disease enter that, that system. So, uh, just very quickly then, um, our future considerations at this point in time is we want to replicate that forest user survey. So we, we actually see the social science as being important, but on a limited budget, um, it's, it becomes even more important. Uh, and then we wish to con continue with our communication engagement process. We talk about this process of education, regulation and legislation, that it's a process. What we're trying to do is, um, we're staying in that education pre-regulation zone, and that is for those really high risk industry groups, that those industry groups actually determine their own best practice guidelines around Cody dieback and promote that amongst their own members. So um, ultimately just to reiterate, this is about he healthy forests, it's also about healthy rural communities that are connected to those forests and, uh, and urban communities. I think it's very, very important to understand that tens of thousands of hectares of New Zealand Cody forest does not, as far as we know, does not have the disease. And it's actually more important, as Jack said earlier, about keeping it out as much as it is containing it. And that we're at the precautionary end of the of the process. So, you know, we'd much rather, a quotable quote, Peter, keep the bastard out, man, <laughs> that's all I can say. And then in terms of the other part, that mātauranga 
and our, and our Kaumatu says, you know, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps this is actually not about integrating those two points of view, that they stand alone, that they both have their own place in in our response. Uh, no reira tēnā koutou tēnā koutou koro matata. Yeah.